Messages uh, in the days we're living in, there's a lot of things going around, but not so much unity. So it makes you think. Ready? I did a sermon a couple of months ago. Trying to remember if we have it on the website or not. How, how important is doctrine? Well, is, is, is anybody else that on the website? I'm not sure. If it's not, we'll get it on there. But it's interesting because I went through the New Testament showing how many scriptures talk about doctrine. And today, so many people say, oh, don't worry about doctrine. You know, just love each other. Yeah. But when you look, most of the problems in the New Testament were about doctrine. And if we don't have doctrine, we don't have nothing. You know, what are we doing here? Might as well go to the mosque down the street or somewhere else, which some do. <laughs> but certainly doctrine is important. But today I am not here to talk about doctrine. Uh, being the first day we are here and the first day we're celebrating with the feast, I always try to start the feast on the right note being here in Jerusalem. And today I want to talk about the land covenant. The land covenant. Because one thing, anybody who's listened to my message or heard me before, you know I do not believe in replacement theology. When I've had the opportunity and the blessing here in Israel to uh, be in meetings with some of the government people, you know, and we talk about, you know, what I'm doing here and what I have been doing here, one of the things that entices these people to want to enhance what we're doing is the fact that I'm completely against replacement theology. And that I can prove it from the Tanakh. <laughs> And as one government official told me, he said, you know, if an, an Israeli comes out and says this in public, they're going to say, well, he's Israeli. But if you come out, you know, speaking English and you say it, it means so much more power. And they're calling us the new ambassadors for Israel. That's the actual title that they've given us. Because what the plan is, is that we will go out and we will take this message here that we learn in Sukkot at our family reunion and we take it back into our countries and before Sukkot is over we're going to go around and see how many countries were represented here and I'm guessing from the list I saw beforehand we're going to have a, at least about 20 countries here. Can you imagine that? A small group like this, about 20 different countries. Which means when we go back to the four corners of the earth, to our countries, that we'll be able to bring this message back to them. And if you don't understand the land covenant, there's many, many things that you're missing out of uh, Scripture. I want to start in Romans 8. Romans 8, the Scripture we've all read. Romans 8, 16 and 17. Romans 8, 16 and 17. It says, The Spirit itself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of Elohim. And if children also heirs, Truly heirs of Yahweh and joint heirs of Yeshua. If indeed we suffer together, that we also may be glorified together. So here we are, what does it say? We are truly heirs and joint heirs. But heirs and joint heirs of what? <laughs> what are we heirs of? We're not doing this for fun, right? There's a reward at the end of, of the, the line. There's gold at the end of the rope. What are we heirs of? And sometimes I'll ask people, what is the reward of the saved? Of course, Christianity, they think it's going up to heaven and playing a harp on a cloud all day, you know, which we know is not from Scripture. But if someone were to ask you, what is the reward of the saved? And some people say eternal life. Yes, that's part of it, but it's not all of it. Well, eternal life, we just said, with Yeshua, right? Yeah, that's another part, eternal life with Yeshua, but that's not all of it. Eternal life with Yeshua in the land. In the land. Can you imagine? This ain't no analogy. This is reality. The very land we're sitting in right now, the very earth, the very soil, the river, the very adumah, as you say in Hebrew, that we are sitting on, that we're going to walk, that we're going to see, that we're going to experience, that you're going to smell, is where you're going to spend eternity. And that's a pretty long time. So we like to tell the story. When I was first coming to the truth, a cousin of mine sent me a magazine from the Church of God that uh, the Father used to call me through, and uh, we were up in the mountains, and he started talking about eternity. Eternity? Where are you getting this stuff from? And 
I said to him, what is eternity? And he gave me this analogy. He said, if you had a 3,000 high foot mountain, which is a pretty high mountain, he said, and if, if a bird came once a year and pecked his beak on that mountain, by the time it would take that 3,000 foot mountain to come down to land level, think about that, 3,000 feet, just once a year he pecks his beak, you're talking about quadrillions, a zillions of years, he says that's one second of eternity. I was like, well, I'm in. <laughs> you know, I'm in. You know, we got what? If you're lucky, like the Bible says, 60, 70 years, maybe 80 if you're lucky here. What, are, what if it was 100? What if it was 200? What if you were Adam and you lived 900? What's the difference when you're talking about eternity? Eternal life with Yeshua in the land. And I'm telling you, as Ephraimites, as Israelites, we've lost that aspect. We've lost that aspect of the covenant. And I say, Yahweh's blessed me from the time I was here last year, and some of the doors he's opened, that I've been able to be the first person he's blessed, Israelite, to come here and now go before the government and articulate in a manner of who we are as a people. Not to come, even, even I know people that have believed the Israelite theory for 20 years and they'll giggle. I'm an Israelite. I don't giggle when I say that. And I say, I'm willing to die for this land. I'm not willing to die for Babylon. I thank the Father for where I was born. I'm not against my country of citizenship. I have my a U.S. citizenship in my passport. I'm keeping it. I'm not getting rid of it. Like the Apostle Paul, that's a good citizenship to have today. <laughs> I also have dual citizenship now. I'm also Italian citizen. So I'm, uh, I'm not getting fanatical. I'm not saying get rid of your driver's license and all these things. What I'm saying is, if you're an Israelite, and whether that means that your great 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 granddaddy was Naphtali, Dan, Simeon, Reuben, one of these tribes here, or if you were pure Gentile and were grafted in, Galatians 3.29, then you are a seed of Abraham and an heir according to the promise. What did we just say is the promise? Eternal life with Yeshua in the land. And the problem is, some groups and some churches that will stand here staunchly and say, the Catholics preach replacement theology because they replace Sabbath with Sunday. And yes, I agree with that 100%. We'll replace the land of Israel with the land of America, or this land, or that land, or that land. Now, I want to read the scriptures, and you be the, you be the jury. You be the judge and jury here. I'm just going to read the scriptures, and you tell me if these scriptures are talking about the very land our feet are on, or they're talking about some land 8,000 miles away. You tell me what was Yahweh's thought when he was describing these things and Moses was writing them down. And who were the people he was writing them to? To the nation of Israel. And that's what it is. By extension, all of us are Israelites living in diaspora. And the time is coming. Can you imagine the time we're living in? That the time that if, if, if we're blessed to be alive in just a few short years when our Savior goes on that Mount of Olives, we will see those feet come down and you will see the greatest regathering the world has ever seen. They are going to come from the north and the south and the east and the west. And their graves are going to open and the people are going to come out and they all are coming to where we are today. Getting chills up your spine yet? I am. Because it's amazing to live in this time. It really is. How do we know it's true? How can you believe it? Because we've already seen Judah is already here. I mean, people are outrageous to say Israel being a nation today is just a coincidence. Really? Really, the only nation ever in the history of the world to revive after 2,520 years? The only dead language ever? Who's speaking Arcadian in here? You know, who's an Amalekite in here? The only dead language in the history of man to be revived in this day. Like it talks about in Zephaniah. And yet... Because there's a blinder that's been put on so many people in the West. The Father is working miracles every day, and it's passing by so many. And they don't even see what he's doing. They don't even see it. So I want to talk today about this wonderful covenant. And I want to start in Genesis 13. And let's look at the land that the Father promised to Abraham. Genesis 13, verse 14 through 18. It says, And after Lot had separated from him, Yahweh said to Abram, Genesis 13, verse 14, Now lift up your eyes and look northward and southward and eastward and westward from the place where you are. So wherever Abraham is, he's looking 
when he can visually see to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And he said, For all the land which you see, I will give to you and your seed always. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can count the dust of the earth, then your seed will also be counted. Rise up, walk through the land in its length and in its breadth, for I will give it to you. The neighbor moved from his tent and came to live among the folks of Mamre, which were in Hebron, and he built the altar to Yahweh. So here he is. You know where Hebron is? Ten miles down the road. <laughs> right here on this Adamah, this earth that we're sitting on. And this is the promise. He didn't say, Abraham, I'm going to give you a land 8,000 miles away. I'm going to give you Canada. I'm going to give you America. Not that there's anything wrong with it, you know. We'll take any land, right? Temporarily. But the eternal land is right where we are sitting. Right where we are sitting. To the north, the south, the east, and west. One more scripture is Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34. 1 through 4. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. We're not going to be... Uh, no, actually, we might be in that. Yeah, we will be in that area. You can actually see it. When we go down toward the Dead Sea, you'll be able to see Mount Nebo through there. And Yahweh caused him to see all the land from Gilead to Dan, and all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah to the sea beyond and the Negev, in the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, to Zoar. And Yahweh said to him, This is the land that I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your seed. This is the land. But what is so hard to understand about that? This is the land. Look through Genesis to Revelation, you're not going to find a scripture of any other land. This is the land. And like I said, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, if we're going to get on the Catholics and we're going to get on the Protestants for replacing the theology of Saturday to Sunday, then we better make sure we don't lose replacing the land with Disneyland or somewhere else, wherever it is. This is the land. I've sworn to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, saying, I will give to your seed. I have caused you to see with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. This is the land. I have a whole sermon on that. You know, is... Uh, I think it's called this America Israel. But uh, it's not really my purpose today. I just want to set a point there. What I want to show you is, if you're not grasping the land covenant, you're not fully grasping the new covenant. And some people misinterpret me when I said that. You're saying we're not in the new covenant. I didn't say that. I mean, sometimes I feel like uh, I'm, I'm with a jury of lawyers sometimes. <laughs> you know, every word they better watch what comes out of my mouth. And that's why I repeat it sometimes. What I'm saying is, if you are not grasping the land covenant, you are not fully grasping the new covenant. I did not say we're not in the new covenant or you're not in it. I believe fully I'm in the new covenant. I had an argument with uh, a minister about two years ago on that who didn't believe we're in the new covenant. He said, boy, if you're not, I know I'm in the new covenant. If you're not, I, I'll pray for you. I feel sorry for you. But what I'm saying is, when I read these scriptures and I show you what the new covenant is, the land covenant is such a part of that new covenant that if you're not grasping this aspect, then you're missing something. You're missing something in your calling. Exodus 6. Exodus 6, 6 and verse 2. And my point is, the people, the land, and the covenant. You can't separate either. You know, it, what I, I love talking with uh, Protestant ministers sometimes. You know, when they'll say the law's done away with, and I'll, I'll say, well, who's the new covenant with? Well, the new covenant's with the church. Really? Can you find that scripture? I know it's there somewhere. You ever hear that? I just read it yesterday. <laughs> really? Okay, take some more time, you know. They go to Hebrews 8. I don't want to go to Jeremiah 31, because they'll say, that's the Old Testament. Go to Hebrews 8. Who is the new covenant with? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. It never changed. The people, the land... And the Torah, all three are in every covenant in the Bible. The Torah never changes, the people never change, the land never changes. It's the same in every, every covenant there. So Exodus 6, verse 2. It says, Now Elim spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. And I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Almighty, El Shaddai. And by my name Yahweh, I had not been known to them. And basically meaning they didn't refer to him as that, but they knew his name was Yahweh. They knew that from Genesis 4. And I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, 
which is, was before Israel, this was called Canaan, the land of their travels, which they abode. And I also have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egypt, and will deliver you from their slavery, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And I will take you for myself, for people, and I will be Elohim to you. And you shall know that I am Yahweh your Elohim, the one bringing you out from under the burdens of Egypt. And I will bring you into the land which I raised my hand. What does that mean? You raise your hand when you're taking an oath. You go into court and you raise your hand and say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And Yahweh is saying, I raised my hand to him. And you think he's going to lie? No way on earth. I raised my hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. And I'm telling you, when you go down to Beersheba and you look at that well that Abraham dug with his hand, and it's a play on words, because Sheva means seven, and Sheva means oath. And it's a play on words you see a lot in the Bible because it was an oath that was sworn at that well, the well of seven. And can you imagine that our forefather Abraham, that we can't wait to see, a couple of years ago we were blessed to go to Hebron, and we were just meters from his bones that are laying in that grave. And I was thinking of uh, Hebrews the 11th. Abraham did not receive the promises, but he's waiting that we're going to go together. And I'm thinking, wow, here's my father sitting in that grave, and I'm the last generation just saying, hurry, God, we do it. And then when he's raised up, and we'll be raised up, and we'll meet him together. Can you imagine that? And to be that close to where his bones are laying. With Sarah, with Isaac, with Jacob. Here in the land of Israel. I'm telling you, you come here and there's something that clicks. There's something that comes alive. You see the stones. Archaeology, 130 years old, but it was prophesied 3,000 years ago in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 63, Isaiah 64. The dust of the stones will cry out. And they'll take the ruins and rebuild them. Nowhere in the world that you can go and see the past, the present, and the future. All in this little land about the size of New Jersey. 22,000 archaeological sites since 1948 and they haven't even scratched the surface yet. And every single one tells a story. Every single one. We were having our Bible school a couple of years ago and we were going to Megiddo. The day before we were going there, or two days before, prisoners were trying to get out of the prison and as they were digging through, they wound up hitting the oldest mosaic the church in the Middle East. And we almost got to see it because the man who... Uh, was opening it up for us. It, it just didn't work out. We almost got to see it. But these things happen on a daily basis. They're finding things from the temple. They're finding things from here. And we're living it. We're living in these times where these things are coming alive. Jeremiah 11. And like I said, the land, if you look at the land covenant, the land is the land of Israel. And some may ask, well, why is, was America so blessed? I don't believe America was blessed because America is the new Israel. I believe America was blessed because of Genesis 12. I will bless those who bless you and curse you and those who curse you. And there are many Israelites living in America. My guess is at least 100 million Israelites that are living there. But I always say, when, when Babylon came here and they destroyed the temple and they took all the Jews to Babylon, did Babylon become the land of Israel? No. When Assyria came here, Sennacherib, and they came and they destroyed the north and they took all the Israelites out to Assyria and these other places. Did Assyria become the land of Israel? No. What happened was there were Israelites living in diaspora in Assyria or Israelites living in diaspora in Babylon. But just the fact that people of a land were taken captive somewhere didn't change that land today. It's the same with America today. America is not Israel. <coughs> There's a lot of Israelites living in America, but certainly America is not the land of Israel. And I'm going to prove that to you in a few minutes here. I'm going to prove to you because I'm going to read about the blessings and the cursings, and we'll see that America never did scripturally what they needed to do to get those. Uh, Jeremiah 11, we'll go here first. Jeremiah 11 and verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh saying, 
Hear the words of this covenant. So here it is again. You know, when we hear the word covenant, what is it? A binding agreement, a sacred agreement between two parties that each has a responsibility. Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and to those living in Jerusalem. And say to them, so says Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them from the land of Egypt, from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all that I command you, so that you shall be my people, and I will be your Elohim. In order to establish the oath, Remember we just talked about the oath he gave to Abraham? In order to establish the oath which I swore to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as to this day. Is the land connected to the covenant? Yes. Of course it is. Of course it is. Then I answered and said, Amen, O Yahweh. And Yahweh said to me, Declare all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. Hear the words of this covenant and do them. And again, you know, i got to say one thing for Judah. Judah made a lot of mistakes in their diaspora, but there's one thing that Judah didn't do. In 2,500 years of living in diaspora and being assimilated among the nations, they never blended with the nations. They always kept their identity. And even till today, Jews that are living, even in America, they live in their own sections, they marry their own people, and they stay separate. Ephraim never did that. We got taken into captivity and we assimilated with the pagans and we grabbed their ways and we did all these things. And it's prophesied. And it's also prophesied, though, that in the end time, in the last generation, that we would repent for the sins of the forefathers and we would come out of all that. Amen. And the fact that we're sitting in these chairs and throwing away the Christmas trees and throwing away the Sunday worship and all the other paganism is proof, clear proof, that prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. Now, let's go to Leviticus 26. Because this is the scripture that sometimes churches have used to say why America is getting blessed. And then they'll say, you know something? America just uh, made a law for homosexuals. And now their blessing is going to be taken away because they made this law. And what I want to do is I want to read you here Leviticus 26. And I want to ask you, did America ever fulfill scripturally to get the blessing in the first place? Let you decide. Let's read it. Leviticus 26 and verse 3. I'll read 3 through 6, then I'll drop down to 14 and 15, and then drop down to 31. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rains in their seasons, and the land shall give her produce, and the trees of the field shall give her fruit. Now let me ask you a question. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, did America as a nation ever keep the commandments of Yahweh? Was the Sabbath day ever a commandment in America? No. There were Sabbath keepers in America, but it was never a law as a nation. America never kept them. And that's what Yahweh is saying. If you walk on my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then you will get these blessings. I don't believe Yahweh expected America to do it because America wasn't the land of Israel. But just the point, if someone's trying to tell you Read Leviticus 26 and say the reason why America was so blessed financially was because they kept the commandments and now all of a sudden they're not keeping them and that blessing's being taken away. That's not true. One of the commandments, the third commandment is you shall not take the name of Yahweh, your Elohim in vain. That's what the commandment says. It doesn't say the name of the Babylonian deity, God. You shall not take the name of Yahweh in vain. What does in vain mean? To change, to falsify, to make common. When did America ever uplift the name of Yahweh? Never. Never. And if you look at most of the commandments, America did not keep them. And just because there was physical blessings of prosperous financial things, don't think that's always a blessing either. Because I'll tell you today, America, sometimes people say, oh, you come down too hard on America. But I'm telling you, America is in the poorest spiritual condition they've ever been. Hopefully, Yahweh's people there aren't in those conditions. I'm saying the nation. I'm not pointing a finger at anybody because I'm an American. So if I'm pointing it at, at anyone, I'm pointing it at myself. But as a nation, they are in the poorest spiritual condition ever. And they're still the richest nation on earth. They still have all these things. But America was blessed because America blessed Israel. 
America stood up for this nation. There wouldn't be a nation of Israel if it wasn't for America. Yom Kippur War, 1973. They were going to lose that war. And Golda Meir, in the middle of the night, calls up President Nixon and pleads with him. Mr. President, we need help. And Nixon tells the story. We're told it when he was alive. He said his mother, when he was a little boy, told him that the day would come that he would have the opportunity to save the Jewish nation. Don't fail. And he said that came to his mind. America did the greatest, largest airlift since World War II to bring a whole military fleet over here in a day and save the nation. Was America going to get a blessing about that? You better believe it. But I'm telling you, in recent times, since the Oslo Accord, since Madrid, the roadmap, whatever you want to call it, is all the same thing. And trying to force Israel to divide the land, that blessing is being moved. And I'll read you the scriptures here. When that happens, when Israel makes this peace plan, when they divide the land here, and when America is pushing for it, you're going to see all hell break loose really, really quick. So let's look now. Read verse 5, Leviticus 26. So he's saying, he'll give rain in their seasons, verse 4, and the land will give a produce. Which land is he talking about? The land of Israel. That's the land they're in. They just came to Israel. They're coming here. And the Father is telling the Israelites about the land they're going to. And your threshing shall reach vintage, and the vintage shall reach the sowing time, and you shall eat your bread to satisfaction, and live in your land securely. Like I was saying last night, if Israel never went against the Father in His commandments and the statutes and the judgments, we wouldn't be coming in diaspora to keep this feast here. We'd be coming as citizens of the country. And I'm going to show you a little bit later in the sermon what we need to do to get back here. Because it's laid out in the end time what's going to happen to the Israelites in diaspora to make them come back. Isn't it amazing? The Father knows the beginning from the end. He lays out every scripture for us so we don't have to leave it for chance. Verse 6, and I will give peace in the land. Really interesting. If you know Hebrew at all, in Hebrew, wherever you see the <coughs> article, the the, the ha, before it, if you go up to a Jewish person and you say ha midash, there's only one place they're thinking of. The sanctuary or temple of Yahweh. Ha, before it, the. In Hebrews, uh, not Hebrews, in Isaiah 7, where it talks about, and the virgin. There's only one. See, whenever it's ha, Ha Oma, you know, one virgin, the virgin. So here, when he talks about the land, Ha Aretz, Israel, there's only one. Ha Aretz. It's never any other land than the land of Israel. And certain times in Hebrew, you could tell by that. You could tell by the verb structure. You could tell by the article exactly what he's talking about. So whenever you see that the land, clearly it's only one land. I will give you peace in the land, and you will lie down, and none will terrify you. And I will cause evil beasts to cease out of the land, and the sword shall not pass over into your land. And if you will not listen to me, and do not do all these commands, verse 14 I'm in now, and if you reject my statutes, and if your soul hates my judgments, so not as to do all my commands to the breaking of my covenant, verse 31, and I shall make your cities a waste, and will make your sanctuaries desolate, and I will not smell your free, sweet fragrances. And I shall make the land desolate, the very land here, which he did. And your enemies who are living in it shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the nations. What do you have? You have the land of Israel. You know, you have Aretz, Israel. And then you have the Goyim. You have the rest of the nations. That's all that's in the Bible. The land of Israel and the nations. Nothing in between. And I will scatter you among the nations and draw out the sword after you, and your land shall become a waste, and your city shall be a desolation. Then the land, right here, shall enjoy its Sabbaths all the days of the desolations, which it did. When they went into captivity with the Babylonians, when they went into captivity by the Assyrians, when they went into captivity by the Romans. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths, talking about the sabbatical year, the seventh year, and all the days of the desolation. And you shall be in the land of your enemies. Then the land shall enjoy rest, and shall enjoy its Sabbaths. It shall rest all the days of the desolation, that which it is not rested in your Sabbaths while you live in it. Very, very clear. Like I said, one land, one people, one Torah. Anything else is replacement theology. And we all have free will, free choice. We can choose whatever we want. But for me and my house, I will obey Yahweh. Show me scripture in verse, and I'll change today. I'm not, I'm not looking to uphold any kind of image or anything else. When I'm wrong, I'll change. And I was wrong. I didn't always believe this way. 
until the Father brought me here. And I wondered, what am I doing here? <laughs> and then he started showing me these things. And I said, oh my. Oh my. Father, I repent. I repent. Thank you, Father. For me. Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18 and verse 26. And you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, and you shall not do any of these disgusting acts, neither the native nor the alien who is staying in your midst. For the men of the land who were before you have done all these disgusting things, and the land is defiled. Do not do these, lest the land vomit you out for defiling it, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. See, there's something really special about this land. For whatever reason, the Father chose this land from creation to set it apart from everything else in the world to bless his people by it. He chose to dwell here, as we're going to see. He dwelt here in the past. He dwells here now. He's going to be dwelling here in the millennium. And I'll show you a scripture to prove to you that he's dwelling here now before Yeshua returns. Right there in the scriptures. Let's go to Leviticus 23 because I want to show you something else. Now, when I was part of Church of God, the holy days were very easy. We get a little pocket calendar, right? <laughs> hey, you never had a question, you know? So for 16 years, it was like, okay, that's it. I got my pocket calendar. <laughs> Until someone comes one day and says, how do you know it's right? I don't know. I never thought about that before. Now, today, 15 years later, we have about 2,000 calendars and, you know, all kinds of different things. But I believe one of the reasons why there's so much confusion with the calendar is the calendar, which I'll show you tonight, it's an it, it's a agricultural calendar. It's clearly an agricultural calendar of the land of Israel. And I get a kick out of it when I hear people telling me, yeah, you know, I knew that it was winter because there was barley uh, in Arizona. <laughs> Thinking, oh yeah, well, you know, maybe there's uh, snow in Hawaii. <laughs> What's, I don't understand it. Where's the correlation here, you know? Because what we see is, like we said, there's one land, the land of Israel, and the holy days, you cannot keep the holy days properly without the agriculture of the land of Israel. Now, it doesn't mean we don't do it. We try our best. That's part of the punishment of the diaspora. That's why I said that it's impossible to do it correctly without the land of Israel. Because one thing is for certain. Like I said, when you got a little pocket calendar, it's simple. You just, okay, it says October 15th, that's it. But when you really want to look at Yahweh's calendar, and you're trying to figure out the, 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 uh, the moon, no matter what calendar you use, there has to be a starting point. There has to be. There's got to be a starting point to any calendar. You know, like now, okay, the sun's got to rise somewhere and set somewhere. You know, it goes around the earth like this, but there's got to be a starting point. Now, man decided we're going to put the starting point right here, you know, in the Pacific Ocean. You know, right, wrong, or indifferent. But the point is, there still has to be a, a starting point. A day has to start, a day has to end. So from Scripture, what we learn is, Jerusalem is the center of the earth. And what did he say, even when they were in the wilderness, about the holy days? When you enter the land... Then you are to, and I'll read the scripture here. Let's go to Leviticus 23. 9 and 10. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and you shall say to them, When you come into the land, when you enter the land which I am giving to you, and you have reaped its harvest and have brought in the omer, or the beginning of your harvest, to the priest. So right there. Now if you're not in the land and you don't reap the harvest, then how do you start your count to Shavuot? Verse 15, And you shall number to you from the next day after the Sabbath, from the day you bring in the sheaf of the way, the omer, they shall be seven complete Sabbaths. Deuteronomy 16 says the same thing. When you put the sickle to the standing grain, you start your count. Now again, why did the Jewish calendar come about? I don't believe it was a devious plot just to deceive people. They were in diaspora. They weren't here in the land of Israel. They couldn't do it. So they had to calculate it. I don't blame them for that. And I'm sure if their hearts were right, Yahweh honored that. But my only point is to show you that without the land of Israel, the agricultural here, we can do our best, but we're not going to do it exactly according to Torah. You know? It's not going to be exactly according to Torah. Drop down to verse 39. Also, in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you gather the increase of the land, you shall keep the feast of Yahweh seven days, on the first day of Sabbath and on the eighth day of Sabbath. And you shall take to yourself on the first day the fruit of majestic trees, palm trees and bowl of oaks, and willow of the valley. That's why I went out yesterday and spent 30 shekels on three little willow brooks. <laughs> Good business they got going there. And shall rejoice before Yahweh your only seven days. 
And we missed that aspect. And you know, when I first came into Church of God, the feast there, it was just unbelievable. You know, and coming there and celebrating it. But by the time I left there, the feast was nothing more than a big vacation. Who's going to Hawaii? Who's doing this? $500 rental cars. And you know what? This is what I say. Just like with the Sabbath, when they changed the Sabbath, it's a fact that they changed the Sabbath by saying, they didn't change it right away, but they said it's not a commandment. Whenever you make something to say, you don't have to do it, but it's a good idea, human nature is you won't be doing it that way. <coughs> Usually it's a generation. In Church of God's case, it just took a couple of years. They went from, okay, it's a good idea, and now it's a bad idea within probably five years. And most of their congregations now in Worldwide Church of God are going on Sunday. So that's the reason why the Father, out of love, makes it a commandment. So for generation, generation, for generation, we will never, ever change it. And it's the same thing over here. It's the th same thing here. That part of the commandment for Sukkot, you know, is living in a very modest, temporary dwelling and taking the fruits of the harvest and coming and appearing before Him. And only in this part of the world can you get some of these fruits. You know, pomegranates, you know, and some of these things, these, these amazing fruits. And there's place here in Israel, only place in the world that actually makes pomegranate wine. And not even all Israel. There's only one place in a certain area because of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. They are using this wine now in hospitals here in Israel intravenously to people. And not just to make them feel happy. <laughs> there, there, there's really, there's real medicinal things with a pomegranate that are unbelievable. That they say for the heart, that for so many things. And they say where regular wine, if you take wine, it contracts your veins. Mm -hmm. That this wine does the, the opposite. It opens them. But it just shows you, like, the Father in this land and the things He blessed it with and the fruits and everything was all according to plan. And in our diaspora, right, where we're different, we've forgotten it. We've forgotten it in our diaspora. The land became nothing. Like, we were so involved with just the Word and the doctrine that we forgot the land. And really, that's why you've got to come here on a pilgrimage like you are and experience it. And you know what I love about it? What I love about it is the looks on your face the first day you're here to the look on your face when you're going to leave. And I love about it where you never know where it's going to hit somebody. Some of them, it's right at the airport, laying on the ground crying, you know, oh, what happened to her? You know? Some people, like I said, it's down at uh, Abraham's well. For other people, it could be the simplest place. And you just see tears come from the eyes. And, and they tell you why it hit them there. But I'm telling you, if you're a true Israelite and a true lover of Yahweh, it will hit you somewhere here. There's no doubt about it. And for me, it's the greatest joy of my life to share it with you. To share the love, because I'm telling you, I love this land with all my heart. Because Yahweh set it apart for us. Out of every place on earth, He could have picked anywhere. And there are some beautiful places. The mountains of, of Italy. You know, there's a place in America. Oh, Colorado was a beautiful place. Pennsylvania. If I had to choose one place on earth, I love where the application, Appalachian Mountains are over there. We lived there for about a year. But I say over here, it's something different. You're not just looking at mountains. You're not just looking at hills. You're not just looking at valleys. You're looking at a land that Yahweh himself says, I watch it from the first day of the year to the end of the year. And I watch it for my people. This is my blessing. You know, you read... Uh, Isaiah 62, the dowry to Yeshua's bride is the land. This is what the Father has set apart as the wedding present to the bride. And he's redeeming it for us. How, how, how wonderful is that? Let's go to Psalm 137. And I say, you know, we're, people will be watching this all over the world today. Read this psalm in your diaspora if you're not here with us. Psalm 137. There by the rivers of Babylon we sat down. Also we wept when we remember Zion. Now remember, these are people that lived in the land. These are people that their grandfathers and their grandfathers, they lived here. From the time that the Israelites came, they had never left this land yet. And now they were come and taken by the Babylonians into diaspora. And they're saying, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and we wept as we remembered Zion. We hung our lyres on the willows in the midst. For there our captors asked us the words of a song. Yea, our, plund our plunderers asked joy, saying, Sing to us a song of Zion. How shall we sing the song of Yahweh on a foreign soil? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget. Let my tongue cleave to my palate. If I do not remember you, if I do not bring up Jerusalem above the head of my joy. 
What's your joy? What is your personal joy? What do you like to do? You like to golf? You like to read? You like to go out in nature? What's your joy? If you don't put Jerusalem above the head of your joy, then you're not living according to the Scripture. And like the song we read yesterday, for Zion's sake I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet. Nag Yahweh. That's what he says. Nag him day and night until he makes Jerusalem a praise in all the earth. I'm telling you, until we remember the land, he is not going to bring us back here. He will not bring us back until our hearts are yearning out that we want to be back here with every ounce of our being. That we want to accept what he created for us. He created it just for us. He molded it. He made the atmosphere, the plants, everything. Because he wanted us. What did Yeshua say? I did not come. Uh, I, I came to give life more abundantly. And that's what he wanted for us. He made this land for us to have abundant life from it. And we see all the scriptures in the end time. What does it say? That he's recreating the Garden of Eden once again. That he's going to create this land. You know something? In 1948 when Israel became a nation, this was a desert wilderness. Go to Jordan today. Go to Egypt today. Go to Saudi Arabia. It is just desert. There's no food. There's nothing there. That's the way Israel was in 1948. One of the biggest places in the world for malaria. That's why you'll see a lot of the eucalyptic trees as we go by that was given by Australia. They're not indigenous here. But here it is. Over 350 million trees that have been planted. As we go in the Jordan Valley and you see all the agriculture and you see the things being planted, 22 end time scriptures already fulfilled right here in this land. And the waters, like it says in Isaiah 35, will gush up in the desert. And they will become like the Garden of Eden. Drive down toward a lot, which was just desert 20 years ago, and see what it is today. Artesian wells from nowhere gushing up and making green, beautiful places. Israel is one of the biggest exporters of flowers in the world, 5 billion flowers a year. And you know what they do? They export them over to Holland and these places who sell them to the Arabs who think they're buying them from Europe. <laughs> <laughs> they're Israeli flowers. But I'm telling you, it is happening before our eyes if we have eyes to see it. If we have eyes to see it, it's happening before our eyes. And I know, I know these trips ain't easy, believe me. These pilgrimages aren't easy. But think how it was 2,000 years ago. You know, the day of Pentecost in the New Testament. These people are living in diaspora. Look at all the lands in Acts 2 where they're coming from. And that was in days there were no airplanes. Those were hard journeys. Sometimes it would take a month or more to come. And yet millions would come here at these time to get the blessing of Yahweh. Let my tongue cleave to my palate if I do not remember you, if I do not bring up Jerusalem above the head or the joy. Here we are, 2009. Captivity is getting ready to end. Doors are being opened that haven't happened in more than 2,700 years. Things are happening that we wouldn't imagine. I wouldn't imagine in my lifetime. And Yahweh's doing it. I know going back in the 1930s, uh, a man who was one of the first Sabbath believers here, Andrew Duggar, probably a lot of you people know who he is, that they had a congregation right here in Jerusalem. He was here in 1932 was sent by the Council of the Church of God's Seventh Day back then. Unanimous vote that Jerusalem is the headquartered church of the Church of God. Back in 1932, came to start that work. One of the first ones, pioneers. And I had the blessing for two years, a couple of years ago, actually pastoring that church, standing behind the pulpit of, I believe, a great man of Yahweh in our time period. But here we are now, 30, 40 years he's been dead. And things are moving along where now Ephraim, the Father is ready to fulfill these prophecies of Ephraim coming back here. And as we come and make these pilgrimages, we are in the forefront. We're coming and experiencing it. The blessing that we have to be a first fruit, to sit here, to represent Yahweh, to learn these things and now go back to our nation and bring hope. Because you know something? Hope is dying. Not only in America, but look around the world. Hope is dying in Africa. Hope is dying in India. Hope is dying in the Philippines. Hope is dying everywhere. Because it's getting bad out there. There's getting floods and earthquakes and disasters. There's a water problem in the world that they're not telling you much about, but a big water problem that you're going to see major things in the next couple of years with water. <coughs> earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes. Wars and rumors of wars. All the things that Yeshua said to the birth pains. When you see these things happen, look up. Your salvation is nigh. It's starting. Get ready. 
and here we are. Here we are to take hope back from the land of hope. To go back and tell people what Yahweh is doing in His land in the end time. How wonderful. How wonderful it is. Luke 17 and verse 21. Luke 17 and verse 21 says, Nor will they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of Elohim is within you, or among you, or in your midst. And, you know, when I look at this scripture, and believe me, I believe Yahweh's kingdom is a real kingdom, a physical kingdom, a literal kingdom. I don't believe it's something, a fuzzy feeling in your heart. But when I look at this about the kingdom of Elohim being within you, I do believe unless the kingdom of Elohim is in you, it will not be the kingdom of Elohim. Can you imagine what people have sacrificed for this kingdom from 30 AD? Can you imagine every apostle that was beheaded, that was martyred, that left their family for months, if not years at a time, to take this gospel to Babylon, to Persia, and all over the world? Can you imagine if you read some of the books like the uh, True History of the True Congregation or some of these other books? Would our forefathers sacrifice that we can sit in this room today and have the knowledge of the truth? Because it only takes one generation as we've lived it where you could lose the truth really quickly. So it's got to go from generation to generation. What sacrifice have we made? We're the last ones now. What are we sacrificing for that kingdom? You know, what are we doing to preserve that if time did go on, if my master did delay, that the next generation is going to be stronger than we are. That our children aren't going to be sitting there with these iPods in their head and all this devil music blasting out of their ears. You know, there was a, there was a I said this one time, and a boy came up to me afterwards, and he had these headphones on, and he said, "No, I just want to let you know, I've got 45 hours of you on here. <laughs> I said, praise Yahweh. <laughs> But it's true. It's true. If we don't sacrifice something now, and our, our Master does delay His coming, I fear for the next generation. I really do. I fear for our kids. I see what's going on. I see, I, I see the manipulative plan of the global powers that they have in the public schools. I see these laws coming through the UN. I see that, and I fear for our kids. I really do. But we gotta, we got to redeem it. We got to take it back, and it starts right here. It starts right in this land, the land, the people, the covenant. And you know, when I go before some of these government people, I say with pride when I tell them, "You don't know our people." And one of the things they said, "You better stress the interior ministry." Is during the antifadas when there wasn't a bus in this whole country, our people came. Our people were here not once, but every feast. And the Palestinians and war and money and other things are not going to fear Yahweh's people away. And they smile. And it makes them feel good. And they thank us. They thank us for our support. And I'm telling you, in 10 years, a lot has changed in this country. A whole lot. Because they weren't like that 10 years ago. 10 years ago was that we don't need anybody. Now it's thank you. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for standing up for us. Thank you for being here. Let's go to Daniel 9, and let's talk a little bit about what do we need to do to be ready to come back when the time is right. And again, I don't give a message like this to have everybody packed up and start running to Israel. I say over and over, the door is not open yet. The door is not open, the visas are not there, but Yahweh willing, they're coming. They're coming. You know? We're at least trying to push it to but we've got to be patient. We've got to be patient with it. But if the door does open and we're not ready, what good would it be? You know, what good would it be? Daniel 9 and verse 3. And I set my face toward Yahweh to say my prayer and holding this desire. Now here's Daniel in what? After he was kicked out of the land, after he's living in diaspora, and this is his prayer to Yahweh from his diaspora for his people. And I set my face toward Yahweh to seek by prayer and holy desires with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to Yahweh my Elohim and made my confession, saying, O Yah, the great and awesome Elohim, keeping the covenant and mercy of those who love Him and to those who keep His commandments. We have sinned and we have committed iniquity and have done evilly. And we have rebelled even by departing from Your commandments and from Your judgments. 
And we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our rulers, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O oh, Adonai, righteousness belongs to you, but to us the shame of faces, as it is to this day to the men of Judah and to those living in Jerusalem, and to all Israel who are near and who are far through all the lands where you have driven them for their unfaithfulness, which they have done against you. O oh, Yah, shame of face belongs to us, to our kings, to our rulers, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To Yahweh our Elohim belong mercies and pardons, for we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of Yahweh our Elohim to walk in his laws, his Torah, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel has transgressed your Torah, and turned aside that they may not obey your voice. For this reason, the curse, and that word in Hebrew is Allah, <laughs> The curse has been poured on us. And believe me, the curse of Allah is poured out on here. And the oath that is written in the Torah of Moses, the servant of Elohim, because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his word which he spoke against us and against our judges who judge us, by bringing on us a great evil. For under the whole heavens it has not been done, it has been done to Jerusalem, as it is written in the Torah of Moses. All this evil has come on us. Yet we did not make our prayer before Yahweh Elohim, that we might turn from our perversities and understand your truth. And Yahweh has looked on the evil and has made it come on us. For Yahweh our Elohim is righteous in all his works which he does. For we did not obey his voice. And now Yahweh our Elohim who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made for yourself a name as it is today. We have sinned and we have done evilly. O oh, Yahweh, I pray to you according to all your righteousness that your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and our father's iniquity, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. And now hear, O our Elohim, the prayer of your servant and his holy desires, and cause your face to shine on your sanctuary that it is desolate for the sake of Yahweh. O my Elohim, bow down your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our ruins in the city which is called by your name. For we do not make our prayers fall before you on account of our righteousness, but because of your great mercies. O oh, Yahweh, hear. O oh, Yahweh, forgive. O oh, Yahweh, attend to us in work. Do not delay for your own sake, O oh, Elohim. For your name is called on your city and on your people. And as you go out here this next week, you're going to see a lot of unrighteousness in Jerusalem. And are we going to say this prayer? Are we going to ask the Father to pour His Spirit on the city to clean it up, to get it ready for the dowry that He's given to us? Let's turn to Isaiah 62. <coughs> For Zion's sake, I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake, <coughs> I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and Yeshua as a burning torch. A nation shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name which the mouth of Yahweh shall name. You also shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of Yahweh and a royal headdress in the hand of your Elohim. You no longer shall be called forsaken, nor shall your land any more be called desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. For Yahweh delights in you and your land is married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your Elohim shall rejoice over you. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, all the day and all the night, that they shall not always be silent. You who remember Yahweh, keep not silent, and give him no rest to him, until he sets up and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Yahweh has sworn by his right hand, who's the right hand of Yahweh, and by the might of his arm, surely I will no longer give your grain as food to your enemies, and the sons of the stranger will not drink your new wine for which they have labored. But those who have gathered it shall eat it and praise Yahweh, and they who have collected it shall drink it in my holy courts. Pass, pass, pass through the gates, prepare the way of the people, raise up, raise up the highway, clear it from the stones, lift up a banner. See the banners? That's what it's talking about. Whenever you see that word banner, it's messianic. Messiah is coming. Lift up a banner over the people. Behold, Yahweh has made it heard to the end of the earth. Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, Yeshua comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of Yahweh. And to you it shall be called Soda, 
And to you it shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Oh, Yahweh's done a great work to do here still. But we're seeing it happening every day. We're seeing the redemption. We're seeing the things. We're seeing the finds. And it's amazing. It's amazing to live in it. It's amazing to see it all. Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25, one verse, verse 23. It says, And the land shall not be sold in perpetuity, the land right here, for the land is mine, for you are aliens and tenants. One of the big reasons why Israel cannot divide the land. It's not theirs. They may have a long-term lease, <laughs> but it's not theirs. It's Yahweh's land. He says, The land is mine, it shall not be sold in its perpetuity. Go to the book of Joel. Joel 2. End time stuff. Really neat. Because, you know, sometimes people say, well, that was for the old covenant. Yahweh doesn't dwell there anymore. And now there's not a temple. And he dwells in a heart and all, all these little things. But let's get down to the nitty gritty of it. Let's get down to the scriptures and see what it says. Joel 2 and verse 31. Actually, let me start a little earlier here. We'll start in verse... We'll start in verse 18. It's talking about end time things, and then it says, Then Yahweh will be jealous for his land and have pity on his people. This is end time now. Yea, Yahweh will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and wine and oil. See, you can't separate the agriculture from the land. The agriculture is the blessing of obedience. And the feast is about sharing that blessing of the obedience of keeping the Torah. I will send you new grain and wine and oil. You shall be satis satisfied with it. And I will no more make you a curse among the nations. Is Israel a curse among the nations today? Oh yeah, they all hate it. This tiny little nation that does nothing to nobody and everybody hates them. But I will remove the northern army far from you. Where did the attack come in 206? Hezbollah, who's bringing chemical weapons the last month on our border up here. Lebanon, Syria. I will remove the northern ar army from you. And I will drive him into a dry and desolated land with his face toward the eastern sea and his rear toward the western sea. And his stench shall come up and his ill order shall come up because he was doing great things. Fear not, O land, verse 21. Be glad and rejoice, for Yahweh is doing great things. And I can assure you that. I've seen it with my eyes. And the floor shall be full of grain, and the wine vats overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years which the swarming locust has eaten, the locust larva, and the stripping locust, and the cutting locust, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat fully and be satisfied. And you shall praise the name of Yahweh your Elohim, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall not be ashamed anymore. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am Yahweh your Elohim, and there is no other. And my people shall not be ashamed forever. Now go down to verse 31. And the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood. Anybody have any idea when this is? Before the coming and great and awesome day of Yahweh. End time stuff. For it will be all who call on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. For salvation shall be in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as Yahweh had said, and among the survivors whom Yahweh shall care. Is there going to be a great cleansing here? Oh yeah, you better believe there will. Isaiah 4, 2 through 4. Zechariah 8, Zechariah 10. There will be a great cleansing here. And people say, what are you going to do when war comes? Are you afraid? No, I'm afraid. I'm afraid if I'm not here. Because salvation is here in Mount Zion. And if I can see the presence of Yahweh in that mountain shaking, i got nothing to worry about. I fear if I happen to be visiting back in Babylon, this happens. And I'm stuck over there where every foul spirit and demon is going to be. That's more than I fear. But boy, you know, if there's any place on earth I would want to be during this time, it's here. And then the next chapter goes in the same thing, Joel 3, verse 12. I'll start in verse 11. Gather yourselves and come, all you nations, and gather yourselves together around. O Yahweh, bring down your mighty ones. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations around. Kidron Valley, just behind us here. 
Put in the sickle, the harvest is ripe. Go down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And I believe that's where we are. I believe the Father is starting to separate the wheat from the chaff. And I believe right now all of us are in the valley of decision. But remember Luke, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Because by the time the end comes, and that's what people miss in that parable, that he's raising his eyes and it's the resurrection. There's a great gulf. And these are on this side and those are on that side. That's not the time to say, Yahweh, now I'll, I'll listen after Yeshua returns. Because there'll be such a wide gulf between those of eternal life and those of eternal death. One won't be able to come to one side and the other won't be able to go to the other side. Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to come to Yahweh with our hearts, rendering with repentance for us, for our forefathers, for everything. And coming back. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. This is where we are. For the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars shall not give their light. And Yahweh roars from Zion. You know something? Do you remember on Mount Zion how the people were scared when Yahweh roared? I believe when He roars this time we are going to go to that mountain. Because we don't have to be scared if we're in His will. And we are going to want to see His presence. Not the way the Israelites that said, Moses, you go before us. And why was that? Because they didn't know Yahweh face to face the way Moses did. But his people, those people that are living by faith, those people that are, that are living the Torah, those people that are coming to him, and most important, loving our neighbor is ourself. When we're wronged, instead of trying to wrong back, why not just take it? Even if you were right when you're wrong, why not just take it? So what? So what? Because you know what? In the end, Yahweh is the vindicator of everything. And there's been many times in my life where I've been wrongly talked about or wrongly said, and that's what I pray. Yahweh, you know. Even sometimes you can do a good deed and somebody will take it wrong. But he knows all, and that's all that matters. So we're in that valley of decision. He's roaring from Zion, and his voice is heard from Jerusalem. And the heavens will quake, but Yahweh is a refuge for his people and a fortress to the sons of Israel. Who wants to be here? Who wants to be here at that time, right? <laughs> is he in control? You better believe he is. And you shall know that I am Yahweh your Elohim, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. We're going to walk there. You're going to see Mount Zion. We'll go right there. You'll get to see it. We'll talk about it. And Jerusalem shall be a holy thing, and aliens no more shall pass through. And I will cleanse their blood, which I did not clean. And Yahweh is dwelling in Zion. Yahweh is dwelling in Zion. Let's go to Second Chronicles 6. Second Chronicles 6, verse 24 and 25, then I'm going to drop up to verse 36, because again, Yahweh is telling us, as his children, as sons of Israel now, that he's waking us up, what do we need to do in our diaspora to be accounted in that number? Second Chronicles 6.24 And if your people Israel shall be stricken before an enemy, because they have sinned against you, and they shall return and confess your name, and shall pray and make supplication before you in this house, then you shall hear from heaven, and shall forgive the sin of your people Israel, and shall cause them to return to the land which you have given to them and their fathers. Like I said, after 2,500 years, Judah is back, and Ephraim's waiting at the door. Verse 36 when they sin against you, for there is not a man who does not sin, and you shall be angry with them, and shall give them up before an enemy, and their captives shall take them captive to a land distant or near. Exactly what's happened to all of us. Like I said, 20 nations are represented here from Diaspora, but every one of us is an Israelite. And they shall return to their heart in the land from which they have been taken, and shall turn back and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, and we have acted perversely and have done wickedly. Yea, they shall turn back to you with their heart and with their soul in the land of their captivity where they have been taken captive. And they shall pray toward their land that you have been given to their fathers, Israel, and toward the city that you have chosen, Jerusalem, and toward the house that I have built for your name. Then you shall hear from heaven, from your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication, and shall maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. 
And if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers and their trespass, which they have trespassed against me, and also that they have walked contrary to me, that I have walked contrary to them, and I have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcised hearts are then humbled, and they have accepted punishment for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with, a with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac. And I will also remember my covenant with Abraham. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the next scripture. I'm in Leviticus 26 now. I'm in Leviticus 26, verse 40. I'll read it again. We won't read 40 and 41, but 42. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac. And I will also remember my covenant with Abraham exactly where we started today, right? And I will remember the land. And I will remember the land. The people, the land, and the Torah. They're all the same. You can't separate it. Verse 43. For the land shall be forsaken by them, and shall satisfy for its Sabbaths and the desolation without them. And they shall satisfy for their iniquity, because even because they have kicked against my judgments, and their soul has loathed my statutes. And yet all for that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I hate them to consume them, to break my covenant with them, for I am not their enemy. Then I will remember for them the covenant of their first fathers, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be the Elohim. I am here. Wow. Wow. Like I said, to be here, to be living it, to be chosen by Yahweh, to be here this feast, to be representing Him while He's fulfilling all these things. Let's go to Ezekiel 36. The ending shortly. Ezekiel 36, verse 1 says, And you, son of man, prophesy to Israel's mountains, and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of Yahweh. So again, when you look in Scripture, mountains are uh, always connected with nations. So this time, when is Ezekiel written? He's written during the Babylonian captivity. Yet who does he say he's written to in Ezekiel 1 and 2? He's written to the Israelites in Diaspora. So Ezekiel isn't primarily writing to Judah. He's writing to us Israelites. To the mountains of Israel. What does that mean? To all of our nations in diaspora where we are, he's writing to. So let's hear his message. And I will sanctify, verse 23, and I will sanctify my great name, a big part of it, which I've told people here before that I've worked with. And some of the people said, you know, because the Jewish people don't use the name of Yahweh. Ooh, huh. You want to get stoned by a Jew, start saying Yahweh out in public. And they said, you know, well, you know, is there another name you can use or might offend Jewish people? I said, you don't understand. If I use another name, I'm going to be out of here. <laughs> because it's not about me. Yahweh is sanctifying and doing this stuff in the end time. And the scripture clearly says, in this one time, it hasn't happened since creation, but in this time, people will know that I, Yahweh, have done this. Yes. Jeremiah 16, 14 through 21. So there's no doubt who's doing it. And that's what he wants us to proclaim, who he is, what his name is. Verse 24, And I will take you from the nations and gather you out of all the lands and bring you into your own land. We're seeing it. We're living it. And here we are waiting to be next. It's like being in a queue, right? You ever go to somewhere and you're in a long queue and you have to wait in line? And all of a sudden, after an hour, you're so tired. And then when you get to the front, you kind of perk up again. Wow, only two more people. <laughs> Over here, it's uh, at the post office that happens. <laughs> Could be there for all day. But that's what it is. That's what we're like. We're like in a queue and we're waiting to be next. To be taken back to our land. Then I will sprinkle clean waters on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your defilement and from all your idols. And I will give you a new heart. Jeremiah 31, new covenant. And I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. And you shall do my judgments and keep them. We're not doing it on our own. We're not doing it because we're great or we're this. We're doing it because we were blessed by Him putting a spirit in us that can do this. How awesome. How humbling. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. And you shall be a people to me and I will be Elohim to you. And I also will save you from all your defilements. And I will call for grain and increase it and I will not put a famine on you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field in order that you will not anymore receive the disgrace of famine among the nations. And you will remember your evil ways and your doings that were not good. And you will despise yourself in your own eyes for your iniquities and your abominations. Let it be known to you, I am not doing this for your sake, states Yahweh, 
Be ashamed and confounded by your ways, O house of Israel. So says Yahweh, in the day I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste to be rebuilt. And the desolated land will be cultivated rather than being a ruin in the eyes of all those passing by. We're seeing it. You will see it yourself firsthand as we travel around. And they shall say, this land, this land that was desolated has become like the garden of Eden. And the wasted and desolated and raised cities are fortified and inhabited. Seven million people living here now. Seven million people in the land now. And the nations left all around you shall know that I, Yahweh, built the raised places and planted that which was desolated. I, Yahweh, have spoken it and will do it. So says Yahweh, yet for this I will be sought by the house of Israel to work for them. I will increase them with men like a flock, like a holy flock, like the flocks of Jerusalem in her appointed feast. So the waste cities will be filled with flocks of men, and they will know that I am Yahweh. 2,700 years. Ephraim was not keeping a feast here in this holy city. And here we are, the first remnants. First remnants to be back here. Like he says, we're fulfilling this prophecy. Like a holy flock. Jerusalem will be filled again at her feast times. And here we are, Yahweh. We're here because we're covenant people. We're here because we love Yahweh and we love His Torah and we want with all our heart to obey Him because we love Him and we know it's for our good. Yes. And that's what we're here. In the city of the great king. Yes. To proclaim our ministry. <laughs> Jeremiah 3, verse 17. Jeremiah 3, 17. And at that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Yahweh. And all nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of Yahweh, to Jerusalem. And they shall not work, walk any more in their stubbornness of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel. Very soon coming. And they shall come together out of the land of the north, so that the land that I have given them for an inheritance to their fathers. And I say something. After these doors have been opened here, with the people that I've been working with the last year, I realized something. You know, as I'm looking at Ezekiel 37 and the two sticks, what good would it be for Yeshua to return tomorrow and take the stick of Judah and take the stick of Ephraim and put them in one hand if the vexation of Isaiah 11 isn't taken away? Those sticks would rattle in his hand until they kill each other. So the first thing that has to happen is what? Isaiah 11, the vexation of Judah. Judah will not vex Ephraim. Ephraim will not vex Judah. And that's what I'm seeing. I'm telling you, I am so encouraged to see for the first time here since they've been a nation that they're accepting that there's other people, non-Jews, who are Israelites. And they're accepting that they want us to come here. They want us to learn the language. They want us to learn the culture. And they're supporting it. First time, something is happening. Something is happening. And I see the spirit of Yahweh going out in many, many different ways. I see so many people coming out of Christianity, people waking up. I mean, a week doesn't go by, we don't get at least two or three letters or more from the Great Falling Away book. Somebody, oh, I you know, found your book in a garbage pail, found your book at a yard sale. Found it, find it anywhere. I looked the other day on the internet, I found out they're selling it on eBay. Oh. I'm thinking, who on earth is selling that on eBay for $20? No. Yeah, yeah. And somebody put underneath it, don't buy this book on eBay. You can get it for free through this website. It's a great book. But it's true. The Father is working in so many different ways. Wherever we are in the world, there's nowhere that you're living today that you can't say there's not somebody that you can witness to. But they have to understand who they are. See, once you understand you're an Israelite, the Torah becomes easy. And all the replacement theology, and this is for the Gentile, and this is for this, it, it all goes out the window. Once you understand your heritage, because it's written for the sons of Israel. Deuteronomy 11. We'll be ending here in a few minutes. Deuteronomy 11. We'll start in verse 8. It says, And you shall keep all the commandments, Deuteronomy 11, 8, which I am commanding you today, so that you shall be strong and shall go in and possess the land to which you are crossing over to possess it. 
And so that you may prolong your days in the land which Yahweh has sworn to your fathers, again, taking an oath, to give to them and their seed a land flowing with milk and honey. <coughs> For the land to which you are going to possess it, it is not like the land of Egypt from where you came, where you sowed your seed and watered it with your foot as a garden of herbs. But the land which you are entering to possess, it is a land of hills and valleys, drinking water from the rain of the heavens, a land which Yahweh your Elohim cares for, for the eyes of Yahweh your Elohim are always on it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. I read this tonight when we talk about the calendar, when you think in the Hebrew mindset of the circular pattern. You know, Yahweh has no beginning and no end. We think in the linear, he thinks in the circular. But can you imagine? He doesn't say this about Hackensack, New Jersey. He says it about right here in the land of Israel. It's a land that he watches from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. There's nothing that goes on here that Yahweh doesn't see. And some of these videos I'll show you on modern Israel and the wars here, you'll be amazed to see the miracles that have happened. Angels coming on, on, on uh, tanks with swords. And this is all documented by many different people. I mean that it's true. Just in the last war, what happened? You know, I think I was saying about it that the, uh, you know, the woman that came from nowhere, you wonder, how, can, how are no Israelis dying in that Gaza operation? And all of a sudden, this woman comes out of nowhere dressed like an old, old-time, you know, ancient woman, and she's calling herself Mother Raquel. And every house that was booby-trapped, she'd say, don't go in that one, it's booby-trapped. Don't go in this one, it's booby-trapped. And no one knows who this woman was. No one knows where she came from. No one knows where she went. Miracles of Israel. In the 67 war, one soldier, one Israeli soldier came with more than a thousand Egyptian troops following behind him. And all of a sudden, where they're debriefing, there are people that are wondering, what on earth? How could, how could one soldier capture a thousand? Why didn't you hit him over the head and take his gun? He said, we weren't afraid of that soldier. And we weren't afraid of his gun. But when we saw those angels with swords, we weren't going anywhere near it. Is Yahweh dwelling in Zion? You better believe he is. You better believe he is. And I tell you, the fact that you sacrificed to come here, the fact that you spent money and you... You went out of your way and you did all you did. The Bible says when you come to the feast, you can ask for anything your heart rightly desires. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of it. If you have an ailment you've been wanting healed, do you want your, your, to, more of the Holy Spirit? Do you want to know something in your life? Take advantage of it. Like I said, it's a local call. <laughs> <laughs> ask Yahweh. You know, knock and you will receive. Ask him, ask him, you're here. You're here in his presence. The land from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Verse 13. And it shall be, if listening, you will listen to my commands that I command you today, to love Yahweh your Elohim and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul, that I will give the rain of your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain. And that's not just talking about fruits, as we'll talk about tomorrow from the Garden of Eden. Talking about the outpouring of his spirit, the early rain and the latter rain, and we got a lot that we're going to see. That you may gather in your grain and wine and your oil, and I will give grass in the fields for your livestock, and you shall eat and be satisfied. Take heed to yourself that your heart not be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and bow down to them. And the anger of Yahweh blow against you. And he shut up the heavens, and there be no rain, and the ground does not give her increase, and you perish quickly off the good land which Yahweh has given to you. And you shall lay these words up in your hearts and in your souls, and you shall bind them for a sign on your hand, and they shall be for frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them to your sons by speaking them as you sit in your house, and as you walk in the way, and as you lie down, and as you rise up. And you shall write them on the posts of your house and on your gates that your days and the days of your sons may be multiplied in the land which Yahweh has sworn to your fathers to give them as the days of the heavens over the earth. You know, it's said that our forefathers were taken out of this land because of breaking Yahweh's Torah. But like David said, you know, I read the, the book and we win. And the great part about it is that in His mercy, He didn't forget us. Like it says in Amos, you know, that the children of Israel will be like Sand in a sieve, but not one grain will fall to the ground without him knowing about it. And the fact, the fact that every one of us, we were in our mother's womb, 
And he called us from wherever we were. All of us are wicked. You know, who can sit here and say we're not? I'll say I'm probably the most wicked, <laughs> at least my background, where I came from. But that he can change us, that he can take wickedness and actually mold it into something that can do something positive according to his spirit. How wonderful, how wonderful that is. And in Amos 9, Amos 9, verse 14 and 15, Amos 9, 14 and 15. He says, And I will bring back the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and live in them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine of them. They shall make gardens and eat the fruit, and I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be pulled up out of their land, which I have given to them, says Yahweh your own You want to know it's interesting? Everybody knows the Torah portion, you know, the parsha that they, they read in the synagogue every week. In 1948, and this is, it's all set beforehand. It's a different reading every week. In 1948, when Israel came back to the land, that Sabbath, this was the Torah reading. Can you imagine these people that just came through the Holocaust? That six million Jews, their mothers, their fathers, their grandparents, they gave their life for next year in Jerusalem. And yet some of them were blessed to come here and say, we got a homeland again. We got a homeland after 2,500 years. And they opened their Bible, and this is the Torah portion from Yahweh. Is Yahweh in the land of Israel in the end time? I pity anyone who doesn't see it. I really do. I do. I'm telling you. I've seen miracles here. I have seen the dead, the dead raised in more than once. Not that I personally have seen it, but it's happened here. Friends of mine have seen it firsthand. The dead being raised, people being healed. The gift of languages, not nonsense, rata -ta -ta -ta, but literally somebody speaking to a Hebrew soldier that doesn't speak any Hebrew, and all of a sudden fluent Hebrew starts coming out of their mouth. It happened to me when I was in Kenya. I spoke a sermon in English, and a man got up at the end and raised his hand and said, everything, he's talked in his language in Kukuyu, he said, everything Brother Don said is true because I don't speak a word of English and I heard every word he said in, in our language. So these things are true. The miracles, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're here. They're not, they may be dormant, but they're alive if we see it. And by coming here, I really, I pray, and I'll give you 110% of myself during this next week to show you and to share it with you. Because I want you to go home, not saying Don said. I want you to go home as an eyewitness and saying, I saw. I saw. I went there and I saw what's happening in Israel. I saw what Yahweh's doing. Did you know that this is happening there? Did you know that this is happening there? Because I'm telling you, the most powerful testimony is firsthand, not somebody else's. It's yours. And we will have opportunity twice. This mic is going to be open, and each one of you, whoever wants to, can come up here and share a testimony in your life. <coughs> you will change your life. Come with us, share with us. So start thinking about it. <laughs> It's coming in a few nights. Last scripture, Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 43. It says, Rejoice, O nations, with him, and let the cherubs of Elohim worship him. Rejoice, you nations, with his people, for he shall avenge the blood of his servants and shall render vengeance to his foes and will atone for his land and for his people. He will atone for his land and for his people. Verse 45. And Moses finished speaking all these words to all Israel. And he said to them, Set your heart on all the words which I have testified against you today, that you command your sons to take heed to do all the words of this Torah. For it is not a useless word for you, for it is your life. And by this word you shall prolong your days in the land where you are crossing over the Jordan there to possess it. I say to you again, the words I'm telling you today, they're not useless words. They are your life. They are your life, they are your promise, they are your inheritance. Eternal life with Yeshua in the land. Go with us.
if you'd like to give a uh, closing prayer. Oh, isn't Yahweh good? I feel so great to be here again. I, I just, in my heart, see the new faces and, and uh, the friends that I haven't seen for a while. I'm very, very thankful. I always speak on this one. It's always been on my heart. I stayed back for a while and it just fills my heart to be back. I mean, it's a place where I'm going to be and I don't mind practicing. <laughs> so let's pray. Heavenly Father Yahweh, uh, we thank you for this time, Father. I just pray that, uh, as John, uh, Don spoke, Father, I just pray that uh, the seeds of your word would set into people's heart and understand how precious you are, Yahweh, and, and for your word and, and what Jerusalem's about, the land come, the people, the land, and the Torah, how this all goes together, Father. I pray that they would understand. I pray that they would grab a hold of this. I pray, Father, that they would share this with people. Father, I just pray that you'd bless this time tonight, Father, as we fellowship together and meet new believers, Father, and we commune with each other, like David said, and have unity, Father. We thank you for this time. Bless us, Father, and uh, give us peace and joy, Father, while we're here. And we thank you for everything and for this time. In the name of Yeshua, I pray.